Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is Asif Qureshi and you are watching Dr. Asif Lectures. If you are new to the channel, please subscribe the channel and hit the bell icon so that you are updated with all the latest videos and courses that we run on the platform of Dr. Asif Lectures. Today, in this video, we will discuss about how to systematically interpret ECG, which is also known as EKG. So throughout the presentation, I'll be either using the word ECG or EKG as it is used in different countries. The full form is electrocardiogram, which you already know, okay? Electrocardiogram basically depicts the electrical activity of the heart and you can actually obtain a large number of information by reading um, an ECG. So many of the students really worry when they get this piece of paper in their hand, you know? That's an ECG strip. And there are so many ups and downs in these blips and so many different labelings. Students really get worried about what this funny diagram is, what this funny graph is. So today's target is basically to make you understand how to systematically approach an ECG so that whenever next time you have this ECG strip in your hand, you are not worried and you know what exactly to actually read and how to approach an ECG, as I say, like a boss and you never make a mistake and you know what you are doing, okay? So let's begin with this first diagram, which is the normal cardiac um, cycles representation on an ECG paper, okay? So let's go through different parts of this blip uh, picture and we'll proceed from there. So the first part that you need to know is that upward curve, which is known as a P wave. A P wave, guys, is indicative of atrial uh, depolarization, okay? After this, you see this big QRS complex, which is representing the ventricular depolarization. Then you need to know what is the upward blip afterwards. That is the T wave, and that actually indicates ventricular repolarization, okay? So we will study this in cardiac cycle, that how exactly atrial depolarize and contract, and then ventricle depolarize and contact, and then ventricle relaxes, systole and the diastole, the whole cardiac cycle. But the target here is to understand how to read ECG, okay? Then you need to know what is a PR interval. It's from the start of the P wave to the just the beginning of the actually Q wave. So the PR interval, very important for you to understand what it is. Then the QT interval, you need to know because we will be later on in this lecture understanding what are long QT, what are short QT, what are the conditions associated with them. So you need to know from the beginning of the Q wave till the end of the T wave is the QT interval. And then we have this ST segment, extremely important, the distance between the S wave and the T wave, okay? Because that is uh, elevated, for example, in MI and depression is also associated with a lot of important findings. So this picture is going to be the gold standard for you for the next few minutes, okay? A P wave, QRS complex, and a T wave. You also need to remember these intervals and the segments. Now, when we say how to approach ECG, you should know that ECG is usually this type of graph paper as I just showed you a minute ago, something like this is in your hand, okay? Now you should know this is called a 12 lead EKG. When we say a 12 lead EKG, that basically means that there are 12 leads connected to your body and they are recording electrical activity of the heart from various directions and various dimensions, okay? So there are three limb leads which are connected to your limbs obviously, uh, which are called lead one, lead two, and lead three. Then there are three augmented unipolar limb leads, which are called AVR, AVL, and AVF. Then there are six chest leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. So there are 12 leads in total, and you need to know, this is why it is called a 12 lead EKG, okay? Let's proceed from there. Also, on an EKG strip, usually at the bottom is a rhythm strip, and rhythm strip is usually run for 10 second time period and that's usually one of the leads, uh, either lead two or lead one. So they run the strip for the whole length of 10 seconds and that is important. We will come to know of its significance later on in the lecture. But for now, remember this is a complete EKG paper where you have uh, short time duration runs of lead 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, and lead V1 to V6. And then there is a long 10 second strip of any one of the limb leads such as uh, usually lead two or uh, lead two or lead one. Okay, in this case, it's lead one. We'll discuss this later on. Now, 
this is another recap of something very important and this is one of the things you should memorize all the time whenever you are looking at an EKG you should know that if you are looking at lead 2, lead 3 and AVF this means that you are uh, interpreting more closely the activity of inferior wall of the heart lead 1 AVL V5 and V6 is lateral wall of the left ventricle AVR V1 and V2 is the right ventricle and V1 to V4 is enter so different directions of heart are best interpreted by looking at different leads of ECG okay and you should be able to know this to understand the ECG appropriately if you are looking at lead 1 what is the part of the heart that you are basically looking at okay now I, 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 I'm showing this again and again if you look at this ECG paper closely there are big boxes lined usually in red color so these big boxes you need to understand what is a big box and what is a small box and what they represent because unless you do not understand what is the ECG material the strip paper how is it calibrated you are not going to you know interpret anything out of the ECG so let's go through this here is a big box and inside you can see five boxes horizontally five boxes vertically 25 boxes in total and what does that basically mean so if you look at the vertical angle that's five millimeter in height and five millimeter in width height represents the voltage and five millimeter is equal to 0.5 millivolts okay the amplitude of the current that the recording is being made for and the width actually means uh, it's recording time and five millimeter basically means 0.2 seconds so this is a must for you to know must for you and this will be an exam question as well when I conduct the test for this uh, ECG course that in a large box what does 5 millimeter equals vertically what does 5 millimeters equals horizontally now let us dive a little deeper into the small box so that's a small box okay and the small box again height is the voltage width is the time and if 5 millimeter was 0.5 millivolts then 1 millimeter in height will be 0.1 millivolts okay that's simple interpretation and in width one small uh, box horizontally is equal to 0 0.04 seconds it's a must for you to understand because without this it will be difficult for you to interpret the ECG okay let's move on that's an important slide guys whenever you have the ECG paper in your hand what exactly you need to look for and I'll make life easy for you. The first thing you need to look for in an ECG paper is, is the lead set up appropriately? Because many of the times, uh, this is a possibility of human error, that the technician has set up the leads not in appropriate appropriate manner you know maybe reversal of the of the leads or lead one is connected in place of lead two something like this so first thing on an ECC paper please do not get that paper in your hand and start saying this is the rate this is the rhythm this is P wave this is QRX complex you have to do it later but first thing first you need to confirm if the ECG paper that you are reading is the correct reading and there is a way to figure that out okay so first thing to do is identify if the leads have been set up appropriately okay the next thing you must look at is rate then rhythm then ST segment is it elevated or depressed T waves QRS complexes QT interval PR intervals and cardiac axis that's all this is what you have to do all the time when you have an ECG in your hand so whenever in life you pick up an ECG paper, I pick up this ECG paper, the first thing I need to do is, is the lead set up okay? All right, the leads are connected okay. The next thing I would always look for is rate, rhythm, and so on and so forth, okay? And there is a reason of this sequence. The reason is why we are looking if the leads are set up appropriately, because without appropriate setup, it's useless to read the ECG. You can always go back to the technician and say that, well, repeat this ECG because you have connected the leads wrong way. So first thing is this, okay? Then why rate and rhythm? Because rate and rhythm, if there is serious tachycardia, if heart is beating too fast or too slow, that is something serious and needs immediate attention. So therefore, rate and rhythm first. Then ST segment, is the patient undergoing MI, for example? So some acute things first. And then you move on to the other things which are also serious, but we, we rate them according to the priority and importance of all of these. So this is actually prioritization of what you have to look for in an ECG paper, okay? So whenever you get an ECG paper, first thing is, 
look at the lead setup. Second thing is rate, then rhythm, then ST segment elevation and so on and so forth. Now that we have understood that these are the nine things that we have to look for in the previous slide. The first of all, we need to see the lead setup. Let us discuss how do we actually interpret if the leads are set up appropriately, okay? So it's very simple, guys. We just take up the ECG paper and look at AVR. You see, there are different labelings on the ECG paper. They will be labeled like this, okay? Lead one, lead two, lead three, AVR, AVLF. So just go to AVR and look for the QRS complexes. And if the AVR, the QRS complexes are inverted, it means the lead setup is okay. Easy, isn't it? But that's something that you should do because if you don't do it, you miss it. So the first thing to do is pick up the ECG paper, ask yourself, I said like a boss, that well, I'm looking at AVR and your colleagues will ask you, why are you looking at AVR? The first thing, AVR? And then you tell them that AVR first because I want to see if the lead setup is okay or not. If the QRS complex, you can see they are all inverted. If they are inverted, the leads are okay. They are, they are fine. You proceed for the next thing, which is the rate, okay? Now let's see how do we determine the rate on an ECG paper. So as I told you, in, in the ECG paper, on the downside, there is always a rhythm street, which is run for 10 seconds usually. And let us see how do we calculate the rate. So rate, what we have to actually look for in rate is, is the rate normal, which is usually 60 to 100 beats per minute, is the rate too fast or is the rate too slow? So these are all very important things because if it's too fast or too slow, you need to act immediately. So that's an ECG where the patient needs attention, okay? Therefore, it is important to accurately measure rate of that particular ECG paper um, for that particular patient, okay? Let's see how do we do it. The first method of doing this is R waves in the 10 second strip multiplied by six. Now, see what does that mean? You simply count the R waves. And now you remember, in the first slide I showed you, there is a P wave, then there is QR. So R is this peak. Where are the R waves? These are all the R waves. So you count, where are the R waves? How many R waves? How many R waves? I can count them. They are 10 in number. So 10 R waves multiplied by how much? Six, because that's a 10 second strip. In order to get one minute's reading, it will be multiplied by six. So let's do that. It's not actually 10 R waves, 12 R waves, I'm sorry. 12 R waves multiplied by 6, and how many beats per minute? 72 beats per minute. So just by looking at the ECG paper, R waves, the peak of the R waves, count them, these red arrows. They are 12 in number, multiply them by 6, and your, <coughs> your heart rate is uh, 72 beats per minute, okay? There is another method of calculating rate, which is uh, 300 is the box number, divided by number of boxes between the R waves, and that should also give you, let, let, let's see how does that work. So you see these little boxes appearing here between one R wave and the other R wave. In this ECG, there are four boxes. So what we do is 300 divided by four and the result you get is 75 beats per You see they are more or less close together, 72 beats, 75 beats per minute. Obviously we are not 100% accurate by these methods, but they give you a very good idea if the heart is beating normally, if the heart is going too fast or the heart is going too slow. In this example, the heart is beating in a normal range, which is 60 to 100. And by both methods, we are getting it 72 beats per minute or 75 beats per minute, both of which are normal rate and the patient is okay as far as the rate is concerned. I hope this is very much clear. If not, please stop the video, rewind the video, watch this again, unless you master this, okay? This is normal. Now, let's talk about rhythm. In rhythm, you have to see if it's a regular rhythm or if it's an irregular rhythm, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, both irregular and regular rhythms are important because um, the management plan of these patients will vary accordingly. And that's a very easy method. You pick up a piece of paper and on this piece of paper, you mark R waves, okay? One R wave and the other R wave. And then you simply move the paper just like this, you see? Just like this. If the next interval between R and R wave is also the same, that's a regular rhythm. And you do that for the whole rhythm strip, okay? In the rhythm strip, you just pick up a paper and <coughs> mark two R waves just like this, just like this, just two red marks or black marks or whatever marker you have, and then move that paper between the R waves. If the distance is equal, the rhythm is regular. If it's not, it's irregular, okay? So what have we done so far? So far, 
we have seen if the leads are arranged appropriately then we proceed it to see what is the rate there are two methods for rate calculation you count all the r waves in the rhythm strip multiply that by six or you uh, divide 300 by the number of boxes between the two r waves and that gives you beats per minute then we calculated if the rhythm is regular or irregular and there's an easy way of moving that card okay uh, just simply calculate or look at the distance between the two R waves to subsequent R waves and if that is regular the beat is regular in continuation with the rhythm segment of the ECG paper <clears throat> this diagram is also uh, showing you something very important you have to look p waves in lead 2 p waves in abr and p waves in the rhythm strip okay and why this is important because this will then tell you if the rhythm is a sinus rhythm what do we mean by sinus rhythm sinus rhythm basically means that the electrical impulses are being generated in the sinoatrial node which are present in the right atrium and this is important because this is the normal activity of heart if your sinoatrial node is not working appropriately and the rhythm is initiating either in the AV node or in the ventricle, then you will not see sinus rhythm. So after lead position, after rate of the rhythm, this is what you have to see if this is a sinus rhythm or not. How can you see if it is a sinus rhythm? First thing, see the P waves in lead 2. If the P waves in lead 2 are upright, that's okay, that's a sinus rhythm. If the P waves in AVR are, are down strike, that's okay, that's a sinus rhythm. And if the P waves are always preceding a QRS complex, which means there is a P wave before every QRS complex, it is indicative of a sinus rhythm. So how can you fix if it's a sinus rhythm or not? By looking at the P waves in three different positions. P wave in lead two, P wave in AVR and P wave in rhythm strip, which is the 10 uh, second long strip. Look P waves in all these positions and you should be able to figure out if it's a sinus rhythm or not. So what have we done so far? We have looked at the leads are okay. We have looked at the rate. We have looked at the rhythm. We have looked if it's a sinus rhythm or not. Let's move on. Now we need to interpret on the ECG what is the situation of the ST segment. And this is the ST segment I told you between the S wave and the T wave. First thing you need to see if the ST segment is elevated or not. Okay, and how do you do that? Look in all the leads, all 12 leads, look at the ST segment. And this is the question you should ask yourself, how much elevation is important? Okay, and here's the answer. If the J point is one millimeter above the isoelectric point, uh, except v, V2 and V3, because in V2 and V3, we go for two millimeter. And now you know what is two millimeter, because I told you in the first slide, what does the box, the red box look like? Go back, watch the video again, if you don't know what is two millimeter, okay? Now, what is J point? What is isoelectric point? So on an ECG paper, the P wave, then the QRS complex, and then the T wave. The, the, the normal isoelectric position is, is, is the J point indicative. As you see here on this ECG diagram, you see, the Q, the Q, R, and the R is never coming back. There is no S wave actually. And at the, at the middle, it was coming down, but at the middle, it is continuing as a T wave. So it is above the isoelectric point, which was the baseline of the ECG. If it's above the isoelectric line, how much above? One millimeter above the isoelectric line. It, except in V2 and V3, it's called ST segment elevation, significant. And in V2 and V3, if it's two millimeter above the isoelectric point, it is a significant ST elevation. And you do not send these patients home because these patients need immediate treatment. Why? Because look at the list of differential diagnoses. These patients may have ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction, serious emergency condition, okay? Uh, that may be pericarditis, principal angina, or left ventricular aneurysm and a lot of other things, but the most important one needing immediate attention would be ST segment elevation MI, okay? Let's move on. You now need to see if the ST segment is depressed below the isoelectric point and ST segment depression, how much depression is called a depression is more than 0.5 millimeter in any two leads is important, is significant, okay? In any of the two leads in the 12 lead EKG, if your ST segment is below uh, more than 0.5 millimeters in any of the uh, leads, you know, uh, two leads, and this is serious. And there are different variants. There's a down sloping ST uh, depression, there is an up sloping ST, but the most common one is the horizontal 
ST segment depression. The ST segment goes down horizontally and this is indicative of ischemia. Do not send these patients home as well because they need serious attention. So see how important this is. If, if rate is disturbed, serious problem. If ST segment is disturbed, serious problem. ST elevation, ST segment elevation MI, ST depression, ischemia. This is why these are the first things to look in an ECG paper. If the rate is abnormal, if the rhythm is abnormal, if it's a sinus rhythm, if there is ST segment elevation or depression, all very, very important parts, okay? You see, so the, these arrows indicate ST depression. They're below the isoelectric point. Now, the differential diagnosis could be non-ST segment elevation MI, posterior wall MI, digoxin, left ventricular hypertrophy, but you need to remember the horizontal ST depression, ischemia, hold the patient, treat the patient, okay? Now, we want to look at QRS complexes. The QRS complex that we talked about in the very beginning, um, we have to uh, understand if this is a wide QRS or a narrow QRS, okay? So what is the definition of a wide QRS? A wide QRS is anything more than three small boxes, which adds up to 0.12 seconds is a wide QRS. Anything less than three small boxes, to make it simple, is a narrow QRS, okay? So you should be able to interpret that. And here comes this algorithm. If the patient is tachycardic, how will you know the patient is tachycardic? What is tachycardia? High rate um, of the heart beats, okay? If it's more than 100 beats per minute. If the patient is tachycardic, you need to ask yourself, if it's regular or irregular, you getting me? Regular and irregular rhythm. So the first thing was rate. Rate will tell you if this is uh, tachycardia or bradycardia, low heart rate. And after rate, you need to look at rhythm, if it's regular or irregular. And if it is regular with a narrow QRS complex is the set of the diseases you need to worry about, okay? If it is regular, but with a wide QRS, these are the set of diseases you need to worry about. If it is irregular and narrow QRS, this is the set of diseases. And if it is with wide QRS, so now, now you need, now you know the importance of a systematic approach towards an ECG. First thing, look at the lead placement. Second thing, rate, because rate will tell you if it's tachycardia or not. Then rhythm, if it's regular or irregular. Then sinus rhythm, if it's sinus rhythm or not. Then look at the QRS, if it's wide or if it's not. So these steps will help you pick up any potential disorder the patient is going through, okay? So this is called um, a formulated, a systematic approach to an EKG. Now imagine this, if you first see QRS complex and everything else was normal and you are, you know, struggling for the diagnosis, doesn't work. You have to do this in order. First thing first, then second, then third, then fourth, and then fifth, okay? Let's move on. Let's look at the PR interval, okay? You know the PR interval was from the P to the R, actually the Q wave, which is what we call the PR interval. You must know a P, normal PR interval is less than 0.2 seconds and it's called prolonged if it's more than 0.2 seconds, okay? Next, we need to look at the T waves because they are also very important indicators of uh, early ischemia, for example. If T waves, if T waves are, and where were the T waves? P, atrial depolarization, then QRS, and the last wave was the T wave, okay? If it's more than one millimeter depression from the isoelectric point, uh, uh, remember in lead one, lead two, lead three, this is normal. We're talking about anything other than this, particularly in AVL. If in AVL, you see a T wave inversion, the T wave, other, rather than the upward blip, it gives you the downward blip. And I'll show you in a minute what does that mean. If it's a downward blip and how much down? More than one millimeter, that's a sign of inferior wall MI, okay? And these can be the differentials. Patient may have ischemia, left ventricular hyperbundle branch, proc, etc., etc. But uh, this is how it should look like. Is this something normal looking to you? No. Why? Because the, see, see the P wave is okay, the QRS complex is okay, but the T wave should be an upward blip, but it's a downward blip here. You see the T wave here? It's a downward blip. So this is called T wave inversion. If this happens in AVL, serious problem, okay? Now, sometimes there are biphasic T waves. What does that mean? Look at the T waves here, okay? There's a P wave, QRS, and then the T waves, there is an upward blip, and then there's a downward blip. So this is called a biphasic T wave. And the biphasic T waves are indicative of ischemia and hyperkalemia, okay? Then you, you look at this, you see, this is bi biphasic T waves. It's not normal. Normally, there is one upward blip. But here, there is an upward blip, and then there is a downward blip, okay? 
Now, sometimes there are flat T waves, no upward, no downward, flat T waves, indicative of also ischemia and hypokalemia. And then, um, always remember there are sometimes the peaked T waves or hyperacute T waves, they're also indicative of important disorders, right? Now we need to look at the QT interval. Look at the ECG picture here, the QT interval is prolonged. And remember, it's a very important question in examination that you need to know what prolongs uh, the QT interval. When we call it prolonged, are written here, more than 460 milliseconds in females and more than 450 milliseconds in males is called a prolonged QT interval. I have told you in the beginning how to count the milliseconds and the seconds. If it's more than 460 in females and more than 415 males, it's prolonged. And the common causes for prolonged T waves are drugs, antiarrhythmics, antibiotics, antipsychotics, antiemetics, also, some electrolyte dis uh, abnormalities such as hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, ischemia and, and prolonged QT is important because this patient, if there is a progressive prolonged QT interval, may undergo torsades de point, okay? So that's a serious disorder which needs immediate attention. Therefore, whenever you look at the ECG and you see prolonged QT interval, ask the patient what drugs is he or she on? Stop the drugs. Correct the electrolyte abnormalities, okay? So see, now we are talking about you, you read the ECG, you understand the ECG, and you plan the management accordingly, right? And also the opposite of what we saw in the long QT interval are the causes of short QT interval, okay? Next thing is that we look at the P waves and PR interval. Now, you may be asking that P waves are the first wave in the ECG, P wave, then QRX complex. But Dr. Asif, you are telling us that read the P waves in the end. Yes, because I have designed this approach for you and this is how people do it that address the important emergency issues first. Rate, rhythm. These are the things which need immediate ST segment. They are important to QRX complex, wide or narrow, because that will help you making your differential diagnosis. And P wave, you can live to, you know, wait for the P waves till the end. Rather than picking up P waves first as, as point number one in your ECG will not help your patients because the patients will have more acute, more emergent situations if they have abnormal rate, for example, if they have abnormal rhythm, for example. You need to pick that up first, okay? Anyways, what does P wave tell you? Right atrial enlargement and left atrial enlargement. So if P wave in lead two is more than 2.5 millimeters in height, the, you have to look at V1 now. If it's an upward deflection and negative reflection, um, you uh, should do an echo to confirm that what's actually happening. So any, any abnormality in P wave, uh, particularly in lead two, more than 2.5 millimeters in height, do an echocardiogram and common causes for right atrial enlargement are written here, fracaspid valve stenosis and pulmonary, so anything, any, anything putting pressure basically on the right atrium uh, will lead to light, right atrial enlargement, okay? And you block it afterwards. Now, left atrial enlargement, again, in, uh, in, in lead two, the P waves are bifid. They are bifid, okay? There's a camel hump there. So P waves tell you either uh, you should think about right atrial enlargement or left atrial enlargement or not, okay? Then the PR interval, short PR interval, uh, WBW syndrome and prolonged PR interval indicative of heart block, okay? And when do you call it short and when do you call it long? It's less than 0.12 seconds uh, or more than 0.2 seconds respectively, right? Then you should also be able to interpret by looking at your ECG if there is left ventricular hypertrophy or if there is right ventricular hypertrophy. And the way to do that is uh, you, 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 you see, you look at R waves and S waves, R waves in V5 and V6 and S wave in V1 and V2, add them up. And if it's getting more than 35 millimeters, uh, then you call it, you label it as left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, the opposite is true for right ventricular hypertrophy. You look uh, R waves in lead 1 and 2 and S waves in lead 5 and 6, add up their heights and if it gets more than 10 millimeter, that is right ventricular hypertrophy, which may be because of COPD, interstitial lung diseases, anything where the right ventricle is having difficulty in pumping the blood outwards, okay? That will lead to right ventricular hypertrophy and also left ventricular hypertrophy, anything which is giving problem to the left ventricle to pump the blood out. For example, high blood pressure, hypertension, aortic stenosis, when there is a lot of resistance outside and the heart is pumping like, 
because the aorta is stenosed because of atherosclerosis, because of hypertension, all these things, your left ventricle is having a tough time pumping the blood. So you can pick that up by reading the ECG, okay? The last thing is the cardiac axis. If the cardiac axis is left deviated, right deviated, or normal. So what is a normal cardiac axis and how do you interpret what is the, what do we actually mean by cardiac axis? Is that which part of the heart is getting the uh, vector in the direction of, okay? So for example, if there is extreme left ventricular hypertrophy, it will be left axis deviation. If there is right ventricular hypertrophy, it will be right axis deviation, okay? So you need to know what is the axis of the heart. And the normal axis is, how do you see that is, look for the R waves in lead 1 and AVF. If R wave is upward in lead 1 and AVF, this is all normal. So you look for the R waves in lead 1 and AVF, they are both up, this is a normal axis. But if the R wave is up in lead 1 but down in AVF, there you have to do something. Now look at lead 2. And if in lead 2, R way is up, then this is a normal axis. If it's down, it's a left axis deviation. So there is an algorithm for you to easily figure out if the axis is normal or not. Repeat one more time. Um, you have to look for which waves? R waves. Where? Lead 1 and AVF. If they are both up in lead 1 and AVF, it's a normal axis. But if it's up in uh, lead 1, but down in AVF, you now check another lead, which is lead 2. And if it's up in there, then it's a normal axis. If it's down in there, you label it left axis deviation, okay? And we discussed the left axis de deviation just now, that uh, how do you proceed? You look at the R waves in lead one and AVF. Lead one, R waves is upright, and in AVF, it's down, it's left axis deviation, okay? Um, and what are the common causes of left axis deviation? Left bundle blood blocks, for example, uh, left bundle branch blockage, left ventricular hypertrophy, inferior wall MI, also hyperkalemia, but by and large, you should be able to figure out if it's left ventricular hypertrophy or not, important for your exams. Right axis deviation. So again, what you have to look for, R waves, where? In lead one and AVF. If in lead one, the R wave is down stroking and AVF, it's up stroking, that's definitely right axis deviation. End of story, okay? And the common causes are right bundle branch block, uh, right ventricular hypertrophy and so on and so forth. So guys, this is what we discussed, okay? Rate. Rhythm, ST segment, T waves, QRS complex, QT interval, PR interval, cardiac axis. Also, at the top, we discussed if the leads are placed correctly or not. That's all you need to know about how to read, uh, how to systematically approach an ECG. So next time, whenever you get this ECG paper in your hand, this ECG paper in your hand, you should be able to know, first thing first, if the leads are okay, if the rate is okay, if the heart is too fast or too slow or normal, if the rhythm is okay, if it's regular or irregular, if it's sinus rhythm, if it's originating in the sinoatrial node or not, what is the status of uh, ST segment? If ST segment is up or down, what is the state of a T wave, inverted T wave, biphasic T waves, acute T waves? What is the QRS complex, wide or narrow? What is the QT interval, prolonged or short? What is the PR interval? And what is the cardiac axis? Guys, you are done. This takes five minutes to read ECG. If you know that you have to look for these nine things, eight things, okay? So if you have a very clear concept in your head that how to approach the ECG, this ECG paper becomes a piece of cake for you. It takes hardly five minutes and then you can uh, you know, remember all the differential diagnosis that should pop in your hand based on the findings of the ECG and each differential diagnosis should be worked upon to exclude the others and reach the definitive diagnosis and manage the patient. But I hope this course helped you understanding how to systematically approach the ECG, okay? With this, I finish here and I will be back very soon with another uh, fantastic course on energy metabolism. Uh, this will include glycolysis, Krebs cycle, lipid metabolism, protein metabolism. So that's beginning uh, from very soon. And I will announce that, uh, that with all my uh, family members at Dr. Asif Lectures. So hope to welcome you another course very soon. Uh, please share the video with your friends, subscribe to the channel if you have not already done so and see you shortly.